that. Look with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verses 7 through 11 is going to be my text this evening as we consider this together. 1 Timothy 1, beginning with verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So I'd like to speak with you in this message on abusers of the law. That's the title, abusers of the law. Now there's no, in my mind at least, biblical subject that has raised more controversy down through church history than the one that I have before me in this message, and that is the relationship between the law and the gospel. It is a subject of great division among many who profess to be the Lord's. Uh, ignoring it will not make it go away. I know some preachers think, well, if we just ignore it, let's just preach around it. But sooner or later, it's going to raise its head, and it'll have to be dealt with. But also, I've found that unless the Spirit of God himself gives us light and knowledge and understanding, no amount of explaining of the difference is going to help either. I've sat through many, many hours of discussion with people on what I believe with regard to the grace of God. And it's amazing. You think that you're glorifying Christ before their eyes and the grace of God because grace is free without condition, all the conditions on Christ. So you'd assume men would rejoice. But people that are attached to law keeping in some fashion or form, whether it's for initiating salvation, something you have to do, taking the first step of obedience, they like to use that term or whether it's obtaining it, they present it being something like, here's what God has done, but now you've got to actually do the receiving, you've got to do something, uh, or whether maintaining your salvation. There's some that would say, right, for our justification, no man is justified by the law, but by our, for our sanctification, for our keeping ourselves, we must come back and put ourselves back under the law. These are the kinds of arguments that you'll hear from, from people. And the more you endeavor to exalt the grace of God, the more they're going to raise their voice in identifying with the law of God. In fact, they'll call you a term that you may have heard, antinomian. The word nomos in the Greek is the word law. So what they say is, you are against the law of God. Well, I find a very interesting conclusion here in 1 Timothy 1 in this matter, and that is that those that pretend and boast to keep the law are actually the true antinomians. They are the ones who are standing in condemnation under that very law that they boast of because they don't give Christ all the glory, you see. That's the seriousness of this matter. And clearly, even for Paul, it was a very serious matter. We just don't have time to be able to see the whole portion at 
one time as I preach. It's just too much here. But we still have to keep things in context. And so you remember that Paul had strongly warned Timothy, as he saw in verse 3, to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That word is an interesting word, to charge. It means to command somebody by transmitting a message along from one to another. It really speaks of an order that comes down the ranks. You don't necessarily have to see the general to believe it. As it's passed down through, here is our command. These are our marching orders. It was passed from platoon leader to platoon leader and on down to the, to the very grassroots forces. That's the term that's used here by Paul with Timothy. He, says, he said, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when he went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some. Here's the message to transmit along from one to another, whoever you see, that they teach no other doctrine. All right, so we can see it's of vital importance. He is denouncing any deviation from the free, unconditional message of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ought to be denounced. There ought, ought not to even be room for discussion in this matter of how it is that God justifies sinners. It's by God's free grace through the one obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy law and justice that God might be just in justifying those that for whom Christ died. That's, that's the sum of the gospel. There ought not to be a question. And you can see in verse 4 that we saw last time, Paul calls any other doctrine useless fables. That's what he calls it, useless fables. And what do they do? They don't contribute to the edifying of, of the saints. It's of no value at all, anything other than Christ and him crucified. It's no value. And then if that were not enough, he insists that those who preach any other doctrine, particularly, as I said, that pertains to our redemption, our justification, our sanctification, exclusively by the blood and righteousness of Christ alone, he calls them false teachers. See, that, that's where people get upset. They say, well, we can be wrong, but you're not saying that we're false teachers, are you? If you preach another way, if a man believes that there's another way that you can stand justified before God other than the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a false preacher. It's just that simple. Paul uses the words here in, in verse 6. He says, from which some having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. That word vain jangling means empty talk. Words without substance. In other words, that are not according to the truth. And therefore what? A lie. A lie. Such preaching is useless to the conversion of souls and it's dangerous. If you point Men, if we point sinners to any other righteousness than that imputed by God upon Christ's obedience, completion of his obedience, his work of redemption, if we point men to any other righteousness, we're making them doubly blind because they're already blinded in thinking that somehow they're righteous in themselves. And then you add to it the reinforcement that, yes, you can do something. To obtain this justification, it's like Christ said, they cross land and sea to make one proselyte. That's all it is. It's not a, it's not a, a converted soul. It's a proselyte. But you've made him twice fold the child of the devil. He, he already was a child of the devil, but now you have doubly sealed him in his profession, in that, in that uh, uh, false hope. And Many set themselves up before others as being teachers of the law. When a preacher stands up and announces his subject that he's going to talk about adultery, not committing adultery, or he's going to talk about, we're going to go down through the Ten Commandments. 
gone to quite a few homes in my business and just an increasing number have those 10 commandments sitting right there by the door. Why do they have those commandments there? It's because they think that they're okay with them, but you're not. So as you come up to the door, what those 10 commandments are saying for those that have put it there is, you need to be submitted to these. And what it's assuming is they are, and you need to be. Wouldn't be any greater deception than for people to be going headlong into hell, holding up a banner of the Ten Commandments as if they've got a hold of them. That's exactly what Paul is writing to Timothy about here in verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law. I run into preachers all the time. They have no interest at all in standing and declaring Christ and Him crucified. They boast of being teachers of the law. They've got doctorates in front of their names that have been assigned and ascribed to them by men for having learned what they need to learn and how they preach. And they become very upset whenever you don't give credence to that sort of preaching. But Paul didn't. Some people might think, well, Paul's making a pretty gentle swipe here in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Why? Because if a man preaches the law as a ground of salvation or of sanctification or of justification or of redemption, any keeping of the law by man, if a man preaches that, he certainly does not understand what he's saying nor what he affirms. He's actually anti-gospel, anti-Christ in what he says. All right, so that's why I said earlier that these that boast of this are really the antinomians, all the while boasting of being the law keepers because they assume that something they do gives them right standing with God. They're actually antinomians. That's not why the law was given. It never was. All right, so to help guide us through this study, I want us to consider three questions. Who are those that abuse the law? We see that described in verses 7 and 8. And then, secondly, look at how men abuse the law. And again, as I said, we're not talking about people out in the street abusing the law. We're talking about men standing in the pulpit who are abusers of the law. That's who Paul's describing here. And then thirdly, why is the wrong use of the law an affront to the gospel? Why is it such an issue? We're going to see that, the Lord willing. But let's look at this first one. Who are those that abuse the law? Well, here in verses 7 and 8 of our text, there are those that think and preach that our obedience to the law is necessary in some way for our salvation in some way. And you'll find people at different points on the spectrum. Some say, well, it's like one man told me, it, it might, you know, 99.999% is what Christ has done, but there's still that hundredth of a percent that man has to accomplish. Man has to do. What has he done? He's undone the very work of Christ. He's undone the very work of Christ. It's speaking here of those who make our obedience to the law in some way, small or great, and, and this is the difference even among churches. You're going to find some that go to the far extreme, insisting on every aspect of the law. I find it interesting, every aspect of the law except for sacrifices. You'll find some that say, well, we're, we're talking here about the moral law, but not the ceremonial. We're talking about the civil. So they divide up the law. They make a smorgasbord out of it, make a cafeteria plan out of it. But you can't do that. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. They make our obedience to the law as necessary in some way, as I said, whether to initiate salvation or to obtain it or to maintain it. You're going to find many grace preachers, many sovereign grace congregations fall under this third category. 
It's subtle. They'll preach that we're justified by the blood of Christ, but to maintain our salvation, we've got to leave Calvary and go back to Sinai. And they insist on it. They insist on it. That's who Paul is talking about here. In Timothy's day, it was the Judaizers who compassed land and sea to insist that believers, and particularly Gentiles, that's who they were after because Paul's ministry was where? Among the Gentiles. So they didn't feel that Paul was really preaching the gospel. I've, I've had preachers tell me that. You, unless you, they say the gospel is a double-edged sword. You've got to preach the law. It swings one way, and when it comes back, then you preach grace. It takes the law, it takes grace in order for God to get the job done. Well, what am I going to preach about the law? That man has something to do with it? That he can somehow furnish the obedience necessary? What, what is it that you want me to preach about that law? The gospel declares it fulfilled. Fulfilled by one obedience. All of the millions of obediences that man might endeavor to furnish are not going to satisfy the law. It's by the obedience of one that God has forever put away the sin of his people. Now, that's good news. That's good news. But if you come back over here to Acts chapter 15, you can see a little bit of the turmoil that was going on in that day. In Acts chapter 15, it says in verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea, where, where was Judea? That was down in Israel. All right, Jerusalem. They taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So that's pretty pointed, isn't it? We're not saying that you need to keep the whole law. We're just saying that in respect for the law, circumcision is still required. Otherwise, you can't say you're saved. It, that was a big issue. And you can see here when uh, verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. All right, so it's not something new. But that that's, you can see the issue there. And I'll leave you to read the rest of Acts 15. But you can see in verse 11 the conclusion. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. That sums it all up. What grace? Electing grace. Didn't look to us to fulfill anything to be chosen. Redeeming grace. God did not look for us to furnish anything. Christ had to die alone. He had to die alone. So in that redeeming grace, it was the the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone that was our salvation. And then that regenerating grace. Was I seeking God? Did the Spirit of God wait till I looked to Christ before then he, he drew me? No. Even in that regenerating grace, it's all of grace. He found, I was found of those that sought me not, the Lord said. And that's true. If, if you think it's in any other way, you, you don't know the grace of God. It's just all of grace. But that's, that's what we see here, and that's who these men were that are described as, as abusing the law. Any man, again, that, that just to summarize it, that preaches any condition or rule or criteria that man has to furnish, I don't care whether you call it free will or whether you call it sovereign grace, a lot of people like to say, well, we, sovereign grace, we believe it's all of grace. You're going to find a lot of sovereign grace people that don't. They still make man's believing a condition for the wrath of God to be removed. They still make man's believing a condition for forgiveness of sins. What, what's the difference between that and free will? The only difference, they say, is, well, we believe God gives the faith, but, well, it's still a condition. You're still making it a condition other than the work of Christ. It's a serious matter. But secondly, let's look at the second question. How do men abuse the law? Now here in 1 Timothy 1.8, it says, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. 
this is a great verse because when you reason with men the way that I'm doing right now, that's the first thing they're going to throw back in your face. So you're saying the law is not good. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> the law is good. It reveals the very holy character of God. But it is only good if a man use it lawfully. Now let me ask you a question. Do you know of any man that has ever used it lawfully? Only Christ. Only Christ. That's why he's all my righteousness. You see, any other thing that you look to will be an abuse of that law. You're diminishing it. If you think that God can accept you based upon your petty obedience and your imperfection, even making faith, is faith perfect? Absolutely not. How can that be my justification before God? The law is good if it is used lawfully. But apart from that, it can only condemn. It can only condemn. Now, the Jews used it unlawfully in several ways. And even today, it's practice among those who have set themselves up as the defenders of the law. Rather than preach the gospel for the edification of the church, they prefer to preach messages of rules and regulations and conditions. And what does that all do to a congregation? Divides it. Divides it. I've been part of many congregations in my history where such preaching has brought great division. Why? Because it gets people's eyes off of Christ and onto each other. And then they begin comparing themselves one with another when in reality, they're all, we're all condemned. If we want to use the law as our standard and our obedience to it, we all stand condemned. And that's why Paul wrote that here in verse 4, chapter 1. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. I come from a better background than you do. I was raised in a home where I was taught to live right, do right, and be right. That's how people reason. And it causes them just to look down their nose. I'm, you know, I heard a man say one time, preacher stand up and say, I thank God alcohol's never crossed these lips. Well, how does that make you any better of a person? In his mind, he thought so. In his mind, he thought so. But he stands condemned with the worst of drunkards. You see, if that's his thought. So that's how we see men abusing the law. But... Even more subtly, you'll find this. Men will use the law and the subject of the law to cover up their malicious opposition to the gospel of Christ. If you begin to talk to men strongly about who Christ is and what he accomplished and you endeavor to keep the focus there, they're going to begin to start playing their ace, if you will, as a card, they're going to try to trump your, your desire to give the glory to Christ by starting to talk about, well, how do your people live in your congregation? They'll ask you questions like that. What is their testimony? And the implication is that the gospel would never get the job done. If you preach, if you truly believe that Christ has finished the work entirely, I'll bet your congregation just full of people that just live in sin and live how they want to. And the implication is you need to be preaching some law to keep them in line. So what they do, they play this card. But subtly, I'm telling you, subtly, the real thing is their hatred for the gospel. Their hatred for a message that gives Christ all the glory. You just mark it down. And the more you try to insist on it, the more you try to bring them back and point them to Christ, the angrier they're going to become. It's been that way. It's the way it always is. They use it to cover a malicious opposition that they have toward the gospel justification by one righteousness, imputed righteousness. Imputed means charged to my account. When Christ died, my sin was put to his account. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Why? Justification is unto life. It's unto life. I have to live. The Lord has to cause me to live. Why? Why? Because Christ paid it all. That's it. 
My sin was imputed to him, charged to him, and his righteous obedience charged to my account. That's all my righteousness before God. But even today, as I said, many will put any condition they can on people under the guise of preaching God's true righteousness. They'll, they'll say, you're not really preaching God's righteousness unless you preach what man has to do in obedience to it. But it's a denial of the one true righteousness that Christ has already established and that God has already accepted and imputed to the account of his people. If you look back here in Romans chapter 3, again, read these verses. Uh, you know, if, if people challenge you, come back to the word. Don't take my word for it. This is what God's word says. I don't know how much plainer we can make it here. And to preach anything else is to abuse the law. It says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, that it doesn't make any distinction between moral, ceremonial, or civil. Like you divide up a pie. You can't. The law. It saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, if, if a man truly believed he was in submission to the law of God, his mouth would be stopped. He wouldn't have an argument. He wouldn't, sit there, he wouldn't be sitting there arguing with you. His mouth would be stopped. The fact that he's still yakking on is why it's called vain jangling. He's never learned, <laughs> never learned what the law says. But here it is, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. No flesh be justified. You know, you, you don't only think, well, if you continue on in that sin, or your sin, you'll not be justified before God. This says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified. Go ahead and put your best obedience up next to it. You'll not be justified by it. That's just as much sin. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now here is what we read. But now, now, the righteousness of God without the law. It doesn't mean God set aside the law, but without your obedience to the law. See, keep it in his context. Is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This was even witnessed back there in the Old Testament. There wasn't a soul that was justified by their keeping of that law. Name one. Every one of them fell. Every one of them. They stood condemned even before they started because they were born of Adam. That's why the sacrifices were instituted. That pointed to the one sacrifice that was necessary, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. See, if, if, you're, if you're saying it's part Christ's righteousness imputed, but then it's also an imparted righteousness that you need, something in you, then it would, it would be plural, wouldn't it? The righteousnesses, one of God and then one in you, but that's not what the scripture says. Even the righteousness of God, which is, again, look at what the scriptures say, by faith of Jesus Christ. That faith that sets Christ forth as being the only righteousness. His obedience unto death is our only acceptance with God. It's objective, the faith, revealed. It causes one in whom it's revealed to believe, yes, but it's, it's by the faith of Christ, the gospel. It's how, what the gospel says for unto all and upon all them to believe, for there's no difference. So my believing is the evidence that this work was accomplished for me, but it doesn't initiate it, it doesn't accomplish it. For all have sinned, that could also be translated all did sin, when? When Adam fell. All have sinned. It, the, the sense is at one time. Now we're all individuals here, and if it pertain to our sinning, we can't say that we're all sinning in the same manner at the same time. But all have sinned. All did sin at some point in time. When? When Adam fell. And therefore, short of the glory of God. What's our hope? Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace, in combination with your obedience, and through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Is that what your Bible says? That's how men read it. That's not what it says, though. It says, being justified freely by his grace, 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's it. That's it. So the law for my obedience to it cannot deliver one sinner. Just mark it down. It can't. It can't put away my sin. It requires perfect obedience. Even if you talk about sin in the face of the law of God, you're already disqualified. That's why Christ had to be perfect. He had to be sinless. He had to be obedient unto death. Otherwise, the law would have condemned him for his own sin, you see. But coming back here to 1 Timothy 1.9, we see Paul clearly showing that a truly righteous man, a truly righteous man doesn't need the law. Now, here's where people get upset at you, but I'm not saying this. This is what the Word says, verse 9, underscore it. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man is not made for a righteous man. Why? Well, because if he's righteous, that means he's been declared so already by God on the basis of an obedience already accomplished. Whose obedience? The obedience of Christ. That's what justification is. He's satisfied for his people by his one perfect obedience unto death, the law. And therefore, the law is not made for that man. God will not hold us accountable to that law in any way. Why? Because he held his son accountable. All right? On the other hand, here's the important part here in verses 9 and 10. Those for whom Christ didn't die, are they still under the law? In every way. In every way. See? Those for whom Christ did not die are still under the law and will forever owe a debt to God's inflexible justice in condemnation throughout eternity. That's why they're, they're condemned. Even given their best efforts, they don't have a ransom. They don't have a mediator. They don't have a substitute. Therefore, the right use of the law is not to try to get the redeemed, called out sinners back in subjection to it, See, that would be going contrary to what Christ has accomplished. It's already been fulfilled on their behalf. But, I'll tell you this, it certainly is a legitimate use of the law to warn the unbelieving that unless Christ paid their debt, the very law that they boast of keeping will stand in condemnation against them in the day of judgment. That is true. That is true. Now, certainly those who confide in the law, in religion today, even in an unconverted state, I notice that the law serves to restrain them. It doesn't change them, but it does restrain. And that's why people are fooled. They think, well, look at so-and-so. You know, ever since we, he started learning those Ten Commandments, he's straightened up his life pretty good. You're telling me that doesn't count for anything? Not a thing. Not a thing. It's like a prisoner. You arrest him. You pull him out of his environment, you put him in prison, you lock him up for 24-7, he's going to look like he's changed. He's going to look like things have improved. Why? Because he can't get at what he's normally used to getting at. He's, he's restrained. And that's what the law does. In men's minds, it does restrain some. It keeps them from doing what they would otherwise do because they think, well, if I do this then God's going to punish me. And what they don't realize is they're just like that criminal locked up. That so-called good behavior is not going to free them from the sentence of the law. They stand condemned regardless. And that's why Paul says here, the law was not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy. See that? can't describe one for whom Christ died because he's been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about people that left to themselves. That's all they are. Fame, they're murderers of fathers and mothers, murderers, manslayers, whoremongers. We're talking about quite a number of even self-proclaimed religious preachers in our day that men elevate and exalt and considered to be God's servants who, truth be known, 
are nothing but whoremongers and adulterers and murderers and profane and unholy. And the day of judgment will reveal just what sort of men they are. Why? There's no ransom. Outwardly, they're being restrained by the very law that they preach. But for the law, they stand condemned. It's a serious matter, but not so with the righteous. Verse 9 says, the law was not made for a righteous man. That's my joy. I don't have to deal with that law. I don't have to lay awake at night and wonder how I can better keep it in order to find favor with God. No, I already have as much favor with God as I'll ever have, and that's because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that the law has been set aside, you see, but the Lord fulfilled it on behalf of his people. That's what Christ said in Matthew 5, 17, when he wouldn't follow those rules and regulations of the Pharisees that they set up. They, they said, well, you're setting aside the law. Christ said, no, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it, and he did. His cry from the cross was, it is finished. It is finished. Because he satisfied the law and justice for us, every ordinance that once stood against us has now been put away, been done. And we're not under the law as a condition for salvation. We're not under the law for a condition for blessing. We're not under the law for, as a condition for future glory. <laughs> it's either finished or it isn't. Now, does that mean that we'll openly live against its precepts? See, this is another argument. People say, well, then you're, what you're doing is giving a free reign to people just go out there and live against the law. God forbid. Adultery is still sin. Isn't it? Stealing is still wrong. Isn't it? The law is good. I believe the, the right use of the law is threefold. If I just sum it up this way. It, first of all, it shows us our continual sinfulness before a holy God. That's why I don't put any confidence in my obedience to it. Because all it can do is point out what's wrong. It's like having a perfectionist as your boss or your father or your husband and everything you try to do to please them they're always just pointing back at something wrong something wrong something wrong well, that's what it's designed to do it cannot condone anything less than perfection all right but secondly it's given to reveal to us just how merciful and gracious God is in having satisfied that law by his son the Lord Jesus Christ can't you see the grace of God and what he accomplished that's why all the glory goes to him. But thirdly, it continues to serve as a teacher. You know, it's like getting your hand smacked. You, don't you dare look to that law for any kind of acceptance before God. It can only slap your hand. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. It was, that's why it was given, to bring us to Christ alone for salvation, for justification, for sanctification, and everything pertaining to life and godliness and blessing. It's in Christ and what he accomplished, period, exclusively. If that's not your acceptance, you have no acceptance with God. Here's the third and final question. Why is the wrong use of the law such an affront to the gospel? I've tried to preach it just like I see it here in this text, and it's pretty plain. that There's an opposition here. Paul says that in verse 10. Any one of these things that is contrary, it says at the end of verse 10, to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. What's our standard? The glorious gospel of the blessed God. Here's the real issue of trying to mix law and conditions with grace and righteousness. It's an affront to the very gospel of God to say that in spite of all that the Lord Jesus accomplished somehow, those for whom he died are still under the law's condemnation. Paul said, if righteousness come by law, like we read it in Galatians 2.21, Christ is dead in vain. That's what you're saying. Christ died in vain. And to mix the righteous with the wicked. Remember Abraham's prayer for Sodom? I wrote this note down, but just note the reference is 18.23. That's how he started interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, Surely, Lord, you would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So the Lord let him pray on. How many, for how many righteous will we spare this city? There wasn't one there. Every person that died in that city, in that death, died justly. They weren't the Lord's. The Lord never mixes the righteous with the wicked. 
He knows his own. He knows those for whom Christ died. <laughs> and it's on that basis that they stand justified, not because of any works in themselves, but because of the work of Christ the substitute, you see. And Paul shows here the glory and grace of the gospel. Verse 11, we'll come back to this, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. That's what I need to hear as a sinner. That's what you need to hear. Notice how it's identified. He's called the blessed God. God is truly glorified and blessed in what his son accomplished. And in that only can he be glorified. So let's not seek to glorify him in any other way. And then secondly, it's called the gospel. It's called the glorious gospel. See that? According to the glorious gospel, the blessed God. Why is God blessed? Because his son satisfied every aspect of his law and justice. Why is it the glorious gospel? Well, because there's much of the glory of God in it. All of it's in it. All of it. You can talk about God's glory and creation and providence, and certainly that's so. But if you want to see where God's glory is manifest, it's in the gospel of substitution and satisfaction and imputed righteousness. That's where it shines on the face of Jesus Christ. And if you want to know who, who's truly preaching, who's truly a servant of God, you're going to find him to be one that does like John the Baptist, nothing else but behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Not trying to mix grace and works, but giving all the glory to Christ. All right.